So we're now in section chapter 7, starting section 7.1. This is just going to be an overview of the section. 7.1 is an extremely important section, and you should do two things besides watching this video. You should go back and look at the actual PowerPoint slideshow for section 7.1. It will be in the same module, all right? And you should also read the textbook for section 7.1. This is a very, very important section. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. So we're talking about random variables still. And so what is a random variable? It's a numerical measure of a probability experiment. What does that mean? It means we're going to repeat something over and over again. And the outcomes are going to be quantitative, numerical. Okay, and they're also going to be random, and by random what we mean is we have short-term uncertainty, but in statistics we're looking for long-term patterns in order to make predictions. Okay, what are the two main types of random variables? Well, we have discrete random variables, which we already talked about in Chapter 6, where you have a limited number of outcomes. That's a little bit erroneous. You have gaps in between the outcomes. Okay, so like you could have the random variable equal 1, then the random variable equal 2, the random variable equal 3, but there's spaces in between the possibilities. For a continuous random variable, you can get anything on the number line. There may be a beginning and there may be an end, but think about time. Time starts with 0 and I can record how much time it takes you to walk to your car. Okay. Any particular amount of time, like say 3.7897 seconds, is a possibility. There's no numbers excluded. In contrast, when we go back to discrete, the number of friends you have, one friend, two friend, three friend, you can't have 1.3727 friends, but with time that's continuous, you could have, excuse me, 1.2389 seconds. So when you have a discrete random variable, what you have is a table listing all the possible outcomes and their corresponding probabilities. But you can't do that with a continuous random variable because you have infinitely many outcomes. And you change your approach completely. Before we had individual outcomes listed and their corresponding probabilities. Now we can't do that. All right, There's too many. There's infinitely many possible outcomes. And so they use something called a probability distribution function. This red is the probability distribution function. And probabilities correspond to areas under the curve between the x-axis and the curve. Do you see this purple area right here? It represents an area. And what it represents is the probability that this continuous random variable takes on a value of 2100 or less. Right? 2100 or less. With a continuous random variable, you can't look at probabilities at a point. You have to have intervals. Like say, what's the probability that the random variable takes on a value between 1800 and 2100? And it would be the area above the 1800 to 2100 and below the curve. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But there's a fundamental difference between discrete random variables and continuous. And with a continuous random variable, you always have to have a curve. And that curve is called a probability density function. In chapter 7, we're going to focus on something called the normal probability distribution. The normal probability distribution is the main type of continuous but it's not the only. We can also look at something called the t-distribution, which we will later, and also something called the chi-square distribution. Those are all continuous. Just the normal is the main type of continuous distribution. and It'll be the main focus for the rest of the course. You can pause this and read this, but again, as I've indicated, it's important that you both read the text for this section and that you go back and look at this actual slideshow that's not narrated where you can slow down and read everything. Chapter 7 should be entitled Continuous Random Variables with an emphasis on the normal distribution. Okay. What's the main difference between the discrete probability distribution and a continuous probability distribution? Again, with a discrete, you have spaces between the outcomes. Okay. And you list the possibilities like 0, 1, 2, 3. And there's spaces. There's nothing between 0 and 1, nothing between 1 and 2, etc. You list the possibilities, the outcomes of the random variable, and then you list their corresponding probabilities in a probability distribution table. You cannot do that with a continuous distribution because you have infinitely many 
uncountably of too many possibilities. So, again, knowing that there is a distinct difference between a discrete random variable and a continuous random variable is super important. We're going to focus on this normal distribution that you see in this picture. Okay. Now, in Chapter 7, we introduce the normal distribution, and then we'll use that. This is a flowchart that we'll keep re referencing for Chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. But we use the distri normal distribution for Chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. It's going to be a big deal. So the title of Section 7.1 is Properties of the Normal Distribution. In order to prepare for this section, you have to know what a continuous random variable is. All right, You have to remember what the empirical rule is. Remember, that's the 68, 95, 99.7. And you have to remember about the rules for uh, discrete probability distributions. We're going to have four objectives, looking at a uniform probability distribution. The uniform probability distribution will not be talked about in the future that often, but it's a good way of introducing the idea that for continuous random variable, probabilities are computed using areas under the curve. Then we're going to focus on the normal curve okay, for the rest of this section, actually for the rest of the chapter. A probability density function is just a curve that you have to have with a continuous random variable because probabilities equal areas under the curve. What does that mean? You have a curve you say, what's the probability that the random variable takes on a value, say, between 10 and 12, and you mark between 10 and 12 on the x-axis, and you find the area above that interval between the curve and the x-axis. Probabilities equal areas. Now, probabilities equal areas. And so if I want the probability for a random variable that's continuous, that the random variable takes on a value between negative 1 and positive 1, then I have to look at the curve, I have to mark negative 1 and positive 1 on the curve, and I have to compute the area between the curve and the x-axis. Now, technically speaking, that requires calculus, and if you've had calculus at all, what we're talking about is integrating. Okay. If you haven't had calculus, don't worry about it. We're going to use technology to compute these areas, but the main thing that you focus on right now is that for any continuous random variable, probabilities are computed by looking at the area above the interval in question, here between negative 1 and 1, and below the curve given. So above the x-axis between negative 1 and 1, in this specific case, and below the curve. Probabilities are areas for continuous random variables. Is the normal the only continuous? No. There are many more, many, many more, but we're going to focus on the normal, then the t distribution, and in chapter 12, the chi-squared distribution. This next example, just very quick, and it's supposed to like emphasize the idea that probabilities equal areas. So pause this and read this situation, but this is a story about a delivery. It's going to occur between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. We're going to let 0 be 10 a.m. Mark this off incrementally in minutes, and so 11 a.m. would be 60 minutes later. Okay, we have a uniform distribution. You see this equally likely here. Again, pause this and read this story. Okay. So because I have a uniform distribution, I have a uniform distribution, it's all the same height. It's not like a curve. It's a straight line, horizontal line. And it runs between 0 and 60, 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. The area under the entire curve, the area under the entire curve has to always equal 100% because that's everything that can happen. And we remember we talk about percents and probabilities in terms of decimals, so that 100% is going to be 1. And so this is very important. The area under every continuous random variable curve has to equal 1. So in this particular case, this rectangle runs between 0 and 60, between 0 and 60, and so it has to be 1 60th of an inch high in order for this area to be 1. Think about that. So what's the probability that the random variable takes on a value between 15 and 30? For a continuous random variable, it's always an interval, never at a point. There's no area above a point, and so the probability that the person arrives exactly at 30 minutes is zero. That's because the minutes aren't special. 
because you have 30.001, 30.002, 30 30.0000. There's so many possibilities that the probability of getting any exact one value for continuous random variable is always zero. And so to compute a non-zero probability, okay, it has to be an interval. And so when you're working with continuous random variables, they'll always ask you to compute probabilities involving intervals. What's an interval? It's that space between 15 and 30 in this specific case. And so the area under the curve and above the x-axis, above the interval from 15 to 30, is computed to give us this probability that we're looking at right here. Okay. So the area, just using rectangle, area equals length times width, is going to be 15 divided by 60, or 15 times 1 60th, <laughs> length times height, actually. Okay, And it comes out to be 0.25. And so the probability that the UPS driver arrives between 15 and 30 minutes is 25%. The rest of the section is about, all right, the rest of this section is about, uh, the normal probability curve. If you've had calculus, this is the function right here. This is the function that gives that curve, and that's the function that would be integrated. It's very difficult. Well, it's not impossible to integrate this function, but if you had calculus, you want to see this, go to the slideshow. This, is, this won't be operative here, but go to the slideshow Hi. And watch this, this YouTube video. Path lesson, we're going to show okay. how to integrate. Now, what we're looking at are different versions of a normal distribution. Every distribution has three main characteristics. The first one is shape. The shape for all four of these pictures is the same. It's a normal distribution. But every distribution has three characteristics, main characteristics: shape, its center, which we're going to use to measure using the mean and it's spread, which we're measuring here with standard deviation. So shape, center, spread. Now the top two have exactly the same standard deviation, sigma equals one, sigma equals one, but the first one is centered at zero, mu equals zero, and the second one centered at three. Then here at the bottom one, they both are centered at zero, so they have the same mean, but do you see that the blue graph is more spread out? That's because its standard deviation is double the red graph for pink. So we're going to talk about some properties of the normal distribution. It's bell-shaped and symmetric. That's how you describe this. It's symmetric about its mean. Now, in the next section, 7.2, we're going to talk about something called standard normal. Standard normal just means that the center is zero. Because of this symmetry that we looked at in number one here, the mean, the median, and the mode are all going to be the same value, dead center. Okay. Inflection points mean where you change concavity. Concavity means it's a property of a curve. This right here through here, this is concave up. If you make a U with your thumb and your index finger, concave up is facing up. Again, make a U with your thumb and your index finger turn that upside down and that's concave down. So in the middle here we have concave down. All right. Out here on the ends we have concave up. Where a graph changes concavity is called an inflection point. Notice that the curve is facing down and then after that inflection point it's facing up. Where a curve changes concavity is called an inflection point. For the normal distribution the inflection point or the change in concavity always occurs at plus one and minus one standard deviations above and below the mean respectively. So in the homework, they're going to ask you, okay, they're going to ask you to uh, identify what the standard deviation is by noticing where the inflection point is. The area under every curve, every under every curve for continuous random variable is one. That represents 100% of everything. You have something called asymptotic behavior. An asymptote is nothing more than a straight line. And when a graph is exhibiting asymptotic behavior, it's starting to look more and more linear. 
If it's starting to look more and more linear with respect to a vertical line, it's vertical asymptotic behavior. But in this case, it's starting to look more and more linear. Look out here on the ends. The graph, it'll never become a straight line. But it's flattening out, and it looks like it's becoming more and more linear. And we call that horizontal asymptotic behavior. As I go out to plus infinity on the right or negative infinity on the left, we're getting something called horizontal asymptotic behavior. It just means the graph is flattening out. Remember the empirical rule. Look that up. But that means that we're going to get about 68% of the data, plus or minus one standard deviation. All right, 95% of the data between plus or minus two standard deviations and 99.7 between plus or minus three standard deviations. Let's pause this, look this over. But the main thing is, you see that that's minus one standard deviation, that's plus one standard deviation, 34 and 34, 68. Okay. Then if you add up the numbers between plus two standard deviations and minus two standard deviations, that will give you 95. And if you add up the numbers between plus and minus three, it will give you 99.7. The main idea, not all these little details down here, they're true, but the main thing is the 68, 95, 99.7. So whenever we have a sample, we can make a histogram of the sample data. And if the histogram of the sample data looks like it's bell-shaped and symmetric, then we say it probably came from a population with a normal distribution. So this is an example looking at uh, the heights of 52-year-old males. So we're only looking at a sample of 52-year-old boys. So here are the numbers for their heights. This is the histogram of the sample data. Because this is relatively bell-shaped and symmetric, we can make the assumption we're not proving anything. But we can reasonably assume that the heights of these children in the general population have a normal distribution. Again, you take a sample, you construct a histogram of the sample numbers, the sample data. If that histogram is relatively bell-shaped, then we assume that that sample came from a population that had a normal distribution. The next thing is going to talk about how areas equal probabilities equal proportions. We already talked about how with a continuous random variable, areas under the curve correspond to probabilities. Now they're just going to extend that idea to something called proportions. It'll be very easy. Pause this and read this. Okay. Before we begin the next example, let's see if you understand about the co correlation, not correlation, the connection between probabilities and proportions. If 80% of the overall population is right-handed and we randomly select one person out of the population, the probability is 80% that they'll be right-handed. Proportions and probabilities go hand in hand. Again, if 80% of the overall population, that's a proportion, is right-handed, then what's the probability that you randomly select a right-handed person from that general population? The same number. So now we're looking at drafts, and they have an approximately normal distribution for the population with a mean of 2200 and a standard deviation of 200. Draw a normal curve with the parameters labeled. What are parameters? Remember, those are descriptive numbers from a population. So they just want you to label sigma and mu. Shade the area under the normal curve. Why is it a normal curve? Because the population stayed to be approximately normal. Under the normal curve to the left of 2100, it will be easy. Suppose that that area is 0 0.3085. Provide two interpretations of this result. This is just saying that areas equal proportions equal probabilities. So here we have the diagram. We draw a normal curve. We put the center at 2200 because that's mu. Somewhere we should label sigma equals 200. All right. And because we shade this in, this is the area shaded to the left of 2100. That means the probability that you randomly select a giraffe that weighs 2100 or less is 0 0.3085. Okay. The proportion story and the probability story are the same. Think about that. It's pretty easy. 
Don't read 7.2 in the book. I've rewritten the material for our class and it's on Canvas as alternate section 7.2 for StatCrunch. It's a video. There's also a PowerPoint. Also, we're going to be using scientific notation a lot. And there's a folder on Canvas with review materials and exercises with answers.